Okay. Uh, I'm a television engineer. So that's why there's a test pattern. Uh, I was with NRC for 30 years, and uh, I uh, worked in, in Algonquin, and then I moved to Ottawa, and then I moved to JCMT. I'd like to say that I put text on here, but I'm probably going to talk about other things, so it's on there mainly for the record. Uh, this is Algonquin. The, the first time I had ever seen Algonquin was in March of 1965. This is the way the telescope looked, and uh, Bob has already told you about this part. This room was empty. Uh, the whole building was empty. The ribs were just being put on, and that's us standing up on, on this, the first row of the, uh, the structure. And I've timed all this, so uh, I had no background in astronomy other than a few nursery rhymes. <laughs> and uh, I got astronomy lessons from, from uh, yeah, this is, hope this goes away. <laughs> OK. These are my astronomy lessons. I got them from Wolf Med. So sort of general stuff like right ascension is driving east or west, deck is up and down. Uh, learned the coordinates of the telescope, and we also learned a few more things like how to calculate sidereal time, which Wolf said is different from LSD. Uh, and we learned how to spin the uh, knob on this clock to start it. This is our sidereal clock. It has a tuning fork in it. And uh, I'm, I'm sure lots of people uh, here know about that. This is John Shimmons here who was sent to uh, help us out from Parks. And this is Mike Jeffrey, the, the guy who designed the telescope. And that's half the control system that was up there. Anyway, uh, Norm, uh, I had been there for about a year. And Norm came to me one day and said he uh, was going to participate in this, this new experiment. And he needed somebody with television experience. And in my previous life, I had done control systems at, at Stoco, uh, heavy duty control systems at the steel mills. And I had a background in television before that, so I was the guy. They, they also told me they bought three of these things, which are VR1000 Ampex recorders. And the tele er, uh, Norm says that the experiment really only has a 50 50% chance of working. And, and note there's an experiment. It wasn't a project, it was an experiment. Uh, this is the jigsaw puzzle that, that was delivered to Queens because these were used from uh, the CBC. They were all uh, valve or tube type electronics. Um, and the, uh, we spent about three months at, at Queens in the basement of Sterling Hall trying to make the things run. This is Frank Dodd, uh, Bob Chisholm, and Frank again up in the top pictures here. And uh, I'd really like, I put a copy of Norm's uh, um, early reminiscences over on the table there. You might want to read through it sometime. And along with the pictures of the first fringes that came off the telescope. So these were the people involved. Uh, the the uh, DRAO people, but it wasn't DRAO then, it was Energy Mines Resources. And these are the Rogues Gallery pictures out of M50. I don't have pictures of the other, other uh, institutions. And Roger Richards uh, and his uh, technologist Eric Stevens were the uh, two who really produced the majority of the equipment, the, the, the crazy bits that you needed. Uh, this is what the, the uh, first iteration of a, a playback room was at, at uh, Algonquin. And we took up the whole big room in the back. Uh, Bob showed you a map of, of it earlier. Then we went to a smaller recorder um, for, ones, uh, for the outstations. This was a helical scan machine. The others were transverse scan. Uh, these machines uh, were smaller, but the problem with them was they had 350 microseconds of jitter in them. So I had to take all those tapes, play them back again, re-record them on the second machine, on the, the big machine, then we would have to play the whole thing back again. So we did the observing at least three times. Um, and I would do most of that by myself. Eventually we got to uh, VHS cassettes. They hold the 20, one of these boxes holds 26 tapes. Uh, the three of them together weighed the same as two of those big tapes on the other machines. 
So the shipping costs just you know, came way down. Uh, this is Alan Yen standing on something, looking at something. The, uh, the room, as they say, it, it just kind of grew because we didn't really know what equipment we needed when we started this. So we, we knew we needed recorders. We knew we needed time clocks. And after they worked 36 hours a day, they got a little crazy. So, you know, the room looks a little, it's, it's out of focus, but so were they, you know. <laughs> um, we had started out on this baseline uh, from DRAO to ARO, but that didn't work. So we then went to uh, DRTE, which I think somebody talked about here earlier, the Alouette Sat Satellite Tracking Station in, in Ottawa. So they had to carry on their, their satellite observations. They, they pushed some of their stuff out of the road, and we, we brought this pen, uh, recorder from Penticton. This is one of those big monsters that I just showed you. We brought it from Penticton, put it in Ottawa for a week, then sent it back to Penticton. Um, these are the guys tracing out the, uh, the fringes on the floor because there's just so much information that you couldn't distinguish it, so they said, let's trace it. So they all sat on the floor and traced it. Finally, they did find fringes, so there's Don McRae, um, who had, was just the driver, because these guys had been up for 48 hours, and that's Casey Berlanda, uh, Alan Yen, uh, Norm Broughton, and John Gold. John's got the, the fringes in his briefcase, I think. Uh, the, the, the chart recorders, you can see one over on the, on the thing there, on the, on the table. And uh, they traced them because sort of the, the, you got too much information because we had, I think, about eight, eight traces on one chart. So you needed some way to get your mind around all the, the noise. Uh, the, other, the first version of this was the nice clean room. That was the messy room. Then we moved to everything to uh, Montreal Road in, in Ottawa. And this is just, uh, and I moved to Ottawa as well. I used to live at Algonquin. But this is the second, or the third uh, LBI room I, I built. And this was the, the fourth one. This was down at Sussex Drive. By the, then we had, um, using different tape, tape recorders here, IVC 900 series, and it was pretty automatic. Uh, Dave Ford had automated it all. And somebody mentioned the Spiros computer. I, I missed, missed uh, pointing it out, but... Uh, atomic clocks, okay. These are the rubidium standards. These are the synchronometers that we used. You put them all together into a package that you could take around the country. They, they looked like this. This box was temperature controlled, and uh, we just, it was a very simple temperature system. They produced quite a bit of heat, so you just put a fan in the back and blew it out. And we were talking by train, by plane. Cars, cars were no good because there was three of us and a clock and nowhere for the baggage, nowhere for the third guy. Uh, to sit in the back seat, so that they didn't do that again. And that's me uh, waiting for uh, to go to the airport in, in Toronto. <laughs> Hydrogen masers, uh, we bought them in Beverly, Massachusetts from uh, Hewlett Packard, but they were actually variant hydrogen masers. So that's why they're H10As. The uh, U.S. Naval Observatory had an H10, but it was made by Varian. They're identical, except when Hewlett Packard bought them, they put an A on them. Now, we shipped one of them back from uh, 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 here in Penticton to Algonquin in February. We broke all this glass in the bottom of here, and we broke this ring on the top. And it took me a year to glue all that back together, put it back together. It's all enclosed in a vacuum chamber here. This is, this is the tuning frequency. It's about 30 kilohertz, and that, that band is 14, uh, 20 megahertz. So, it's like really looking for a needle in a haystack. This is your um, observatory here. Then it was D DRAO, but under Energy Mines Resources. And uh, now, out on the hill in the back here, these guys decided to climb it and put some BNC connectors under that cairn. <laughs> John was, uh, was great for building little, little cairns. 
uh, Jack Locke arriving, and then we moved up to Prince Albert. And you never want to go to Prince Albert in, the, in February because the Trappers Convention on and all of their hotel rooms were double booked. So uh, they had some problems that way. Uh, the the um, Judrell Bank experiment, Alan had to give the clock the last symbolic tweak. This is Bob Chisholm, Norm Broughton, myself, Tom Legg, and Rupert Clark. And we did the, uh, that's me supervising loading things on into an aircraft. You, you sure can't do that anymore because uh, nobody will let you out near an airplane. Uh, that's the control desk at Judrell. And we stayed in this building down in the corner there. But they, they gave us a free accommodation, but they didn't tell us there was no food. So in the future, I, I packed, I, I spray can, uh, I, I bought some cans of stew and, and uh, soup, and uh, we spray painted them all bright yellow because all this yellow that you see here is the color of our shipping boxes. And the reason they're yellow is because we found out uh, quite by mistake that all of the radioactive material gets shipped in air, uh, by air in those color boxes. So they take extra, extra care of your... Uh... <laughs> now, uh, Arecibo, uh, Norm and, and Chuck took this uh, clock down there, but they had to battle customs, they had to bribe the guy, they had to find a truck because the transportation hadn't been being arranged, and uh, eventually we did find fringes on that, even though the clock had stopped. Uh, this is going to Australia. Uh, we had to go to New York City in a snowstorm, so that's how much snow was left over. It was one of these crazy storms that New York gets every five years or so. And, uh, oh yeah, okay. Uh, Here's Bob Dustin, and he was in the Navy. He's an admiral, and uh, he's giving instructions to all these big stevedores uh, how to load this clock into the back of the, the plane. Uh, they provide us 110 volts, 400 hertz, and Alan got all the ginger ale that he could stuff into him, and he looks a little, a little fuzzy there. Um, but <laughs> Uh, now, I've got to ask Miller who these people are after the, the talk, but we, we also got ourselves into quarantine and took a letter from Taffy Bowen to get us out. So uh, we finally got to the Epping Labs and uh, on our way up to uh, Parks through the Blue Mountains, the wrong side of the road, we, we get to Parks. And... Uh, Okay, this is just getting our, our equipment ready. That's, that's Bob Batchelor uh, standing next to Alan there. Uh, Miller probably knows him. And that's me observing and the operators observing me. Alan's having a sleep, but uh, he, he was getting 40 dangerous winks. He was almost over the edge here. And that's what the parks control desk looked like in those days. And I think the next slide will come in on top of that and show it in the other direction. So they, they had a different sort of indication system from what Algonquin had. And that's their brand new PDP uh, computer, a PDP-9. And John Chimmons had written me a letter a couple of weeks before I left saying that this thing had just arrived. So that was a brand new computer in those days. Uh, Alan finally woke up and did some observing. We're, we're using the helical scan machines here, so all, all of these tapes had to be transferred onto uh, two-inch uh, big machines when we got back home. And uh, Norm made a deal with Paul Wild to take, there was only one atomic clock in Australia at the time, so this was a second atomic clock, and Paul Wild wanted to calibrate his radio heliograph. So we agreed to go up to Kulgura and do that. And a picture of my friend John Shimmons uh, just before he left for Kulgura. Okay, this is uh, the radio heliograph. It's 30, uh, 96 dishes, uh, 13 minute, uh, meters diameter, and they're on a three kilometer circle. And I understand this isn't here anymore. It's gone because all of these wires going into it 
uh, we're in the road of the, the new development there. That's the control desk as you see it in the daytime, but when the, the sun is out, it gives a real-time picture on the uh, displays here, and you can see the sun bobbing around all over the place. Uh, this is the uh, science research station in Chilbolton, England, where Ken, Ken Tapping comes from. And, uh, yeah. and then sometimes we go into NPL, the National Physical Laboratory, because the time and frequency people would get us to check their clocks sometimes. So it's just you know, sort of a courtesy to them to drop in there. Anyway, my time's over. Tim's held up the signs. It, this was all timed, but before you go, you thought we were all just a bunch of fiddlers, and you're right. <laughs> okay. And as I say, I'm, I'm a TV guy. <laughs> What about fringes to Australia? I, I don't think there was. And the main reason was at Algonquin, they had offset the feed by about this much with um, some sort of offset thing on the, Bob, Bob showed you the feed horn. They, they bolted something on and, and uh, put it out there where they thought it, the, the thing should be because there really isn't, there's only you know, five minutes a day or something in a common time. So they were really, you know, pushing it. Uh, I don't know whether we ever got fringes off of, because it was a three-station experiment. Uh, here and, and uh, Australia should have got fringes, but I just don't remember. Because mainly, you know, I, I get, uh, get done with one experiment, and I was looking after all the logistics of how to get everything everything to the right place in the right time or you know get get stuff played back in in time so, so the third pardon what the third station was was Penticton, Penticton. Okay. yeah right. now we probably got fringes from Penticton to Algonquin yeah. but maybe not because of the the offset feed business um, i don't know uh, have you ever found a paper on it no i i don't think it worked and what I didn't say was that we went to Kalgura and the, uh, the clock actually stopped up there, but it hadn't rained in Kalgura for four or five years. We got there, and they had a th uh, we were about a quarter of the way around the array measuring the phases, and we got into a downpour, and everything just turned to mud. Everything was stuck. You couldn't, you couldn't drive a car, uh, the, the, the wagon or anything else. It, it just you know, was gumbo. And, uh, so the whole thing was a bit of a bust. And for me, it was great that the clock had stopped because then I didn't have to take it back home. I, I just shipped it home air freight. <laughs> yeah. What frequency were you asking? You're asking the wrong guy. I, I, it, to me, it was all video I was recording. Yeah, John Galt was big on doing pulsar experiments, and uh, I remember the pulsars coming out in opposite directions. On you know, you, as you went, went through things, they would be coming out this way, and then they'd be coming out that way on the charts. Um, so I say the astronomy part wasn't really my field. I they, they gave me video, I recorded it, and, and hoped the timing was okay. And the the way we we uh, took care of the timing problems because. When we first started out, we said, okay, we'll, we'll set the clocks both together and, and you could tweak them a little bit and make them go where you wanted to. But we found after it was easier if we didn't have to search in both directions on playback. So we would deliberately offset them going in one direction. So then we only had to search in one direction. 
And, uh, but you, you still had to play them back, and hopefully you didn't have to go more than about 20 microseconds, which is a lot of playback because all those channels were 0.1 microsecond apart. All yeah, right. so. We got to end there, so let's thank Joseph yeah. for more.